What are some challenges that you've had to, to, to overcome and, and they kind of keep popping up? Anything? The YouTube finance space, I think, is overly saturated. I think I can't see a future where it exists in the same capacity that it does. And I'm trying to think, how can I make this sustainable? Sometimes I, I feel more burnt out than I have been at any other point. What's driving that? Every single day, eight to 12 hours, I was in my office making videos. And so I didn't give myself any time. That's crazy. At all. I take half days on the weekends, but that's it. That's a lot of pressure to be putting eight to 10 hours in every day. Sure. But I don't know. I, I know there's something else. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. And, that, and that's really frustrating to me because I always had the next thing lined up because yeah. it just happened organically. And the big picture, what is it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I tell I you where know. it's going to be. It's going to yeah. be at the intersection of those three things Probably. we talked about. But the rhythm and the process that you're in just is beating yeah. you down. Well, maybe I just stop. Hey, folks, I've got a great conversation coming up with Graham Stephan a real estate rock star, a self-made millionaire in his early 20s, and now he's become a YouTube icon. And we go deep. We talk about his path to go into YouTube, how it grew. Such a great entrepreneurial story. Talking about burnout and what's next. You're going to love this. Here's my conversation with Graham Stephan. Okay, Graham, so I want to know. Yeah. Do you remember how old you were when you start thinking about real estate as an actual thing? 17. 17. Believe, yeah. What led to that? So it was so silly. I saw a commercial, I believe, on TLC or it was uh, Bravo <laughs> on Million Dollar List. Yes. And it was, like, yeah. and it was just a, a 30 second commercial. Uh -huh. And I thought at the time, that seems really cool. I could do that. Here are like three young guys doing real estate, doing really well, yeah. being their own boss, oh, yeah. living what seemed like an incredible life. I could do that too. Yeah. So and I think that's I, really what got me into it. Yeah. And I want to yeah. break that down. Now, sure. looking back, you kind of laid it out. Three young guys. So you're yeah. young. What are you, high school, senior, or junior? I would have been just graduating. So high just school. graduated, just 17. Barely graduating. Yeah. Okay. And so you see three young guys. So that's that's appealing. That you're, yeah. Okay. That's attainable. Yep. But working for yourself, mm -hmm. were you always entrepreneurial? I think I was. Uh, I remember even being, it must have been kindergarten or first grade. I was so excited to help the school lunch lady. Because it meant that I got to get out of class 30 minutes before lunch. Smart. I'd go in there and put on like the, the head thing and the, you know, the gloves and whatnot. And I helped serve lunch. And in exchange for doing that, I got a free lunch. So I loved being able to just work and do something. And, and I, I just felt really good about working. But that was probably my first foray into like, ooh, I, I get a benefit. There's, there's something that I could get in turn of like working. And, and for me at that time, it wasn't about free lunch. I, I don't think I had any concept of, of money or really anything back then. It was just, I got to get out of school a little bit early, 30 minutes before, and I felt like I was doing something that was just fun. I just yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that's really speaks to the way you're wired though. Yeah. So it wasn't about the free lunch as much as it was. I'm kind of beating the system. I think so. That's what I would assume yeah. with you. I felt special, I think. Well, yeah, you figured out work. something yeah. that nobody else did. Yeah. And I think that's who you are to this day. Is I that think fair? So. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. The reason I bring that up is because so many people who are fans of yours, mm -hmm. you know, or, or who listen and watch my show, they're trying to figure that thing out, right? And of course, we, we teach them that. But self awareness is really, really powerful. And as you look back on that, you kind of always were wired that way. So it makes a lot of sense that you watch this commercial. Yeah. And all of a sudden you go, that's intriguing. So what did you do from there? You watch the commercial. It intrigues you. What was the journey to figure out, I'm going to give this a shot? A lot of that really started a few years prior. I really go back to when I was like 11 or 12. I just was, I've always wanted a saltwater aquarium. Okay. And for one, I think it was one year, <laughs> it was either Christmas or a birthday. My dad and my grandma teamed up and they bought me a saltwater aquarium. Okay. And that got me so into fish tanks. And so I'd go online. I found these saltwater forums and I'd go online and we'd talk to all these other like saltwater aquarium enthusiasts uh, and talk like, you know, tanks and whatnot. And I got obsessed with it. It just became this this hobby that I loved as a kid where I would just finish school, go online and learn about saltwater aquariums. And from there, I met a group of local reef aquarium enthusiasts that would do these meetups. Wow. It was in this guy's backyard and they were called frag swaps where people would take pieces of their coral, like swap and trade them. So my dad- You do realize now yeah. how creepy that oh, sounds? Oh yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> well, it was funny, but I had to convince my dad to let some people come over to the house oh, from dude, the internet. A hundred percent. Because they were either bringing or trading coral. 
Yeah. And they had no idea how old I was. Right, of course. And so not. I'm telling them over email, like, hey, by the way, I'm 12 years old. <laughs> You're going to meet me. <laughs> but a lot of them, like, everyone was really nice and cool and supportive. Yeah. I mean, these were not like creepos from the internet. Sure. They were all like guys with families sure. and whatnot. So, so when they would come, they, they would be really into it, really generous. Uh-huh. But I went to this frag swap. And I got to meet all these people that I was talking to online. It's like a 12, 13 year old. No one knew how old I was. Of course, yeah. But uh, it was through that that I got a part time job at this wholesaler. And it was someone I met at the frag swap. And I was really into fish and coral. And I was taking pictures. And I'd, I'd like be really into photoshopping pictures of like the fish and stuff like that. So I'd post those online. And through that, I got introduced to someone who owned a business and said, hey, if you want to come by, and they were 15 minutes away from where we lived. Uh, you could see the warehouse, and if you want, you, you, you could see what we have to offer, and I would just take pictures. And it was through that that he said, well, you know what? If you want to come and help after school, you're more than welcome to. My mom would pick me up from school, and I'd just go there and help. And a lot of that help was just, like, making boxes. It was organizing the coral, just really doing, like, menial work, but I loved it. Hmm. But that's what got me into the mindset of working yeah. because I would just – all I wanted to do all day was just – I just wanted to go there. Right. Uh, and even in the beginning, I, I wasn't paid. I just got free fish and coral. Right. And so for me, I had this saltwater tank, and I, I could go to a wholesaler with thousands of, of fish and coral. I'd be like, I want that one for working today. And I'd pick it out, and I'd put it in the aquarium. I loved it. But that's what got me into the mindset of wanting yes. to work. Yeah, you begin to feel the exchange. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. how do you go from 17 years old to starting in real estate? Yeah, well, a lot of that was because I had really bad grades in high school because I would ditch school to go and work. Yeah. So I would purposely, I'd call in, I'd pretend to be my mom on the phone. Right. And I'd, I'd mimic her voice and say that, you know, yeah. Graham's not coming in today because he's not feeling well. I'd go to the office and say, I'd go and work. So I had really bad grades, did not get into college. And so my backup plan at the time was I'm just going to work for a year and then reapply to colleges sure. or maybe go to a community college. And I happened to start getting my real estate license around that time. Okay. And before that, too, I, I did a quick, I think it was like a six-week stint. I was doing data entry okay. for this gold company in Santa Monica, and I hated it. I oh, mean, it was sure. like an hourly nine-to-five sort of deal. So that's what really got me uh, thinking that I can't do a set schedule nine-to-five yep. hourly. I wanted to do something for myself. Sure. And so when I saw this like real estate commercial for this show, I thought, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get into this, at least get my real estate license and see how I like it. And that's when I began going to open houses every Sunday just to meet other agents. And I love seeing cool houses too. So oh, sure. all I would do is I would look online or maybe it was even in the newspaper. I can't remember. But I would just look at open houses over $5 million because I just thought, I'm in Los Angeles. I may as well start in like the highest price Why area not? that I can and see those houses. And I just walk up to the agents and I ask them, what is it like being a real estate agent? Uh, what advice do you have for me? How did you grow your business? And is there anything I could do to help? Okay, and we have to stop there yeah. because I love that. Yeah, I mean, this is, I wrote a book called The Proximity Principle, hmm. which essentially says in order to do what Graham wants to do, he's got to be around people that are doing it and in places where it is happening. That's what you did. Yeah. You literally walk into open houses. I'm just curious to know, mm-hmm. were most of the agents pretty warm to no, you? Most of them were dismissive. The so this opposite. was opposite. Oh, so yeah, that's even gosh. tougher. I'm not surprised by that. That's yeah. why I was really curious. They're like, why are you bothering me? I'm trying to right. show a house. Yeah. This was the beginning of 2008. So this must have been like February, March 2008, maybe April around but there. But were there so enough this was, agents that were warm enough to where you got something from it? Yes and no. But just timing wise, this was when the market was going down. So like 2006, the market was on fire. 2007, the market was slowing down. 2008 yep. was the, like the oh, peak yeah. going down. So a lot of agents were telling me, go to college. This yes. is a really bad time to get in real estate. Business yeah. has slowed down a lot. Ugh. Pretty much everyone was like, go to college. Yeah. There were a few that were really nice and helpful, but it just stopped there. And a lot of them were busy too. So like I would just sit there like waiting for 30 minutes for them to have a free second to go and talk to me. Give me quick like, oh, you got to work hard right. yeah. and, you know, do this. But usually the advice was go to college or very dismissive of me. Which so I what were get. the positives out of that experience? After three months of doing that, could have been four, somewhere around there, I met one agent who we talked for like two hours during a slow open house in Bel Air on a house that's like four or five million dollars. He's really kind. And he started real estate when he was 18, and he said he came with no experience, no education, came in, uh, he was an immigrant, 
from out of the country. Love he this. started working real estate when he was 18 years old. He worked a part-time job as a waiter afterwards, so he was doing like two jobs at once. And he was like a top 1% agent in Los Angeles after doing that for like 10 years. Wow. So he offered me an opportunity to come and work for him. Boom. And so he said, you could take on the business that I don't have or whatever you bring in, we'll split it 50-50. And so he just said, and this was completely informal, by the way. So the offer was basically just come into my office the next day and right. I show up early. And so he just says, here's an open house book of everyone that signed in my open houses. Just go down the list and call these people, see what they thought of the open house and then ask them what they're looking for. And then I want you to send an email. So he just walked me through it. So I would just sit there on the phone calling people, hey, you stopped by this open house in Bel Air yesterday. Do you like it? What didn't you like about it? Can I help you find something else? And I would just go and like, those are my first clients. That's so good, yeah. Graham. What was his name? Uh, Vigeli. Vigeli? V Vigeli. Vigeli. Okay. Very hard to pronounce, yes. but he's, he's Greek. Because okay, I love this. Yeah. I, I want young people to catch what happened. You basically got dismissed. Oh, yeah. Most of the time. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in the three to four months of you putting yourself out there, knowing you're going to get dismissed, maybe they'll be kind to you, or you're just kind of there, you run into the right guy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here's what I want people to understand. You made the right time happen because you just kept showing up oh, in yeah. the right place. And then the right time found you. It's not the other way around. I agree. And I think people miss that. It, that took a lot of guts for you. And I'm, I'm also curious – how you would mentally respond to all of these real estate agents saying, kid, go to college. Because oh, yeah. that's this – here's this thing you want to do. You've seen this vision of it on TV. You see that these houses are listed. You're there. And then they keep telling you, don't do it, kid. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, How did you mentally process that to the point you kept showing up and finally run into Vig? I think I was really stubborn and I had this one track mind where if it didn't fit into my narrative, I would dismiss it. I so love like that. a lot of it was if, if they weren't doing well, I would think or if they weren't encouraging, I just thought, well, they're not doing well to begin with or they seem very bitter. And there was a huge change between the top agents who were doing exceedingly well in 2008 they would give me more attention and more positive reinforcement exactly. than the people who were like, oh, go to college. I remember one agent. Her name was Ginger Glass. And she okay. was the first agent. And she's a top agent in Los Angeles. She was the first one that I met that was really positive and encouraging. Uh, she didn't offer me any job. But she but she gave me like five minutes of her time. She which, probably kept you coming she was a, back. She was a top agent at the time, like one yeah. of the biggest agents. And I remember- Did you know that? When oh, yeah. Met her? yeah, yeah. So because you, knew, because you is... could see when you look someone up online, you see all the listings oh, sure. they have. And when you see right. they have like 20 listings over right. like $5 million each, you're like, right. that's a, a top agent. She was encouraging. Yeah. Uh, so, like, that sticks with me that the top agents were the ones who would give me the time and that's didn't huge. just dismiss me. So, now that's a big takeaway. Yeah. You were able to figure it out. And I and I love the gingers of this world. Yeah. You go, hey, and by the way, haven't you found now, because you and I are we're no longer uh, spring chickens, all right? And you got a lot of young people that are thinking about jumping in and they, they have all these fears that are largely based on the unknown mm -hmm. of kind of stepping out on your own. But haven't you found that most successful people are kind of like, hey, come on in the water. It's nice and warm. I think so. I Overall, found that. Yeah. Not everyone. You're right. But most. Because I think they respect in their own way, even though they're older than us, you know, like Ginger. Yeah. She sees you and she goes, there's some hunger. Yeah. And I think there's some real human to human respect, even though you're a kid. Yeah. I think she respects you. Yeah. Well, I think it's when you show initiative first. That's because right. there are a lot of people who just like expect something like, hey, I'm here. That's right. Give me a job versus I'm doing it on my own first. I'm showing you that I could do it. Well, you Here's showed up to, to learn. Offer. Right. What exactly. I love most about that part of your story and maybe one of the things I admire most about you is that early on you just said, I'm going to be a sponge. Yeah. I'm just going to show up and I'm going to learn. Yeah. And that's highly attractive. Yeah. Oh, it's even funny. Uh, before doing that, I'd go on Craigslist and I would go on, I think it was monster.com at the time. And I'd respond to job applications for investment bankers. And I was like 17, 18 that's awesome. years old. And I got, like looking back, it was very cringy. But I went to one, I think it was Doheny <laughs> Capital in Beverly Hills. I submitted an application. I somehow, I think I snuck through the ranks somehow. Like uh -huh. it was an error on their part and I had an interview. They took me out within like a minute or two. They're like, sorry, like they made an error at some point. But I showed up and I, I borrowed a suit. Nice. And I showed up there and they turned me down. 
a lot of MLMs too. Yeah. That I would meet and they were like, we have this great job opportunity. It turned out to be an MLM because they'd want to meet at a Starbucks and pitch wow. me on like some phone service or something. Okay. So, so let's get back to our hero here, Vic. Yeah. So this guy, mm -hmm. he says, come in, he starts getting you work. And how long before you started actually selling homes underneath of him? Yeah, it was nine months to sell my first home. But okay. before that, it was really I got on this track within like two, three weeks. I got on a track of leasing properties. So okay. I realized there was another guy on his team that had started posting lease listings on Craigslist. Okay. And I thought to myself, well, I'm really into photography. So why don't I take pictures of other agents' lease listings in my office? And then I post them on Craigslist. So my pitch was this. A lot of these agents were not doing leases because they wouldn't pay anything. And so a lot of times they'll do it just to keep the relationship with the client. And photography on a lease listing could be like $500. So a lot of times they would just take pictures themselves with right. you know like a crappy camera or like a cell phone or whatever. They were terrible pictures. So I would go to them and I could easily look up all the lease listings in my office and say, hey, I'll take photography for you for free. You could have them, you could put them online. But in exchange for that, I'd love to be able to post your listing on Craigslist and I could represent a tenant. Wow. And if you lease it on your own, I'll get nothing for it. But if I lease it, I'll get the, the leasing side commission. You still Brilliant. get your listing side. Right. So there's no downside. So I got this, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen lease listings that I would post on rotation on Craigslist. And I'd learn which titles do well. And I had a, this is when they allowed HTML on Craigslist, right. but I could have a link tracker. So I would see and optimize for which titles got the most clicks, which price point uh, had the biggest leases. And I really narrowed it down because it was too many, too many to keep track of that in Los Angeles, I got the highest ROI between $5,000 to $12,000 a month okay. in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, West Hollywood, Beverly Wood. Like that was my area. And so I just find lease listings like that and then repost them. And did and it that, take off? Oh, it did. Yeah, at first, I mean, the first few commissions were like 500 bucks. Right. And that, that for me was like, to yeah, make even sure. 500 in a week at 18, like that was insane yeah. money for me. Yeah. Uh, but I kept doing that and I started making three grand a month, maybe $3,500 a lot of a fish month. equipment. Oh, yeah. A lot at of 18, coral. At 18 years old, that was more money. <laughs> I, I would have been happy with just doing that. Yeah, I would have right. been ecstatic. Right. But in addition to that, every Sunday I'd hold an open house. Okay. And I would just bounce around from house to house to house that uh, you know the, the guy I was working for would have. He'd usually have about four to five every Sunday, and I'd sit one of them. Okay. And I'd just meet clients. And nine months in, uh, a doctor came in. And we hit it off. And I think he liked the fact that I was young. I was I'm 18. Sure. I think I was just about to turn 19 years yes. old. Yes. And he asked me how long I'd been doing this for. And I was honest with him the entire way. I was like, I just started. I'm, and I think he liked the fact that I was really hungry for it. No question. Um, and he gave me a chance to find him a house. He ended up buying something shortly afterwards for three and a half million dollars. And so that commission, I think, was like 40 grand. Yeah. At the time when I was just like 19 yeah. years old. And Which that for me like- has to blow your mind. Oh, yeah. When you saw that check. Yeah. And I spent- Almost all of it after tax <laughs> on a Lotus Elise. There you go. I blew all of it. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah. Well, that made you even hungrier. It it did. Well, the car for me was actually a huge in to the car community, and that ended up making me way more money. Right. Like you know, in hindsight, to look back at that and think, oh, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And, right. But by having that Lotus Elise, I took that to listing appointments. I showed up in it oh, uh, yeah. to clients. I go every Saturday, Sunday morning to car meets. I met some really like great friends even to this day That's great. from that Lotus Elise. I love and that. I sold it two years later for the same price I paid for it. So uh, it was see, like, well, that worked out. Uh, nice ROI. Right. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. So you sell homes for how long before you eventually start to go, wait a second, this finance world and money and and, and, and money making money, like when does that begin to, because a lot of people know you obviously yeah. from from your show and then your, your YouTube channel and you go, okay, I'm just curious, when do you start to think, hmm, this is a different path for me? Yeah. I'd always start watching YouTube. So like I would work all day. I'd go to the gym from 9 to 10 p.m., I'd get home, and from 10 to midnight, I would watch YouTube. Okay. And that, for me, was like my TV. What were you and, watching? Uh, stupid prank channels okay. back then. Right. I mean, those mind mind yeah, horrible yeah, yeah. stuff that, like, no right. value whatsoever. Yeah, well, it was uh, resting your brain, right? Yeah, so I would watch YouTube videos, and then 2011 or 2012, I found a channel. His name was Rob Dom, okay. and he made a video about what he did for a living to afford a Lamborghini Diablo. 
and I found that video so inspirational. Because right. here's a guy in his late twenties who bought a two hundred thousand dollar, even back then, one hundred fifty thousand dollars sure. Lamborghini. Oh yeah. And he said, "Well, you know, I started off out of high school. I, I started uh, doing like computer repairs, and I built a computer business, and then I saved up money, and then I bought a Lamborghini Diablo." And he was so upfront about what he did to afford the car, what his payment was, how much he makes. And I was like, "This is so inspirational." I think there's a huge market for people like that. And he kept making videos about like his Lamborghini Diablo. And I was like, there's got to be someone else on YouTube who's, who should be doing this sort of stuff. And I messaged him and I told him, uh, 2012, 2013, and he responded back to me. And I told him on Facebook, there's a huge market for this. If you went into this, I think you could be huge. You could be like a Tony Robbins because I found it so inspirational right. for like an entrepreneur. And that stuff didn't exist on YouTube. And he wow. responded back to me. And just the fact that he replied back was like life-changing to course, me. Of course, right. Um, and so after that, I was just like, I, I would love to be that person, but I felt like who would listen to me? Right. Like I didn't have a Lambo. And I think back then it was like, you need a Lamborghini to be taken seriously on YouTube. So I didn't. But after years of just like putting it off, feeling like, who am I? Who would listen to me? Right. I'm just going to make an idiot of myself. Uh, 20... 16, late 2016, I made my first video about just how I got started in real estate. And I loved it. I posted the video knowing nothing about YouTube. I filmed it on my iPhone. I learned how to edit for free watching YouTube videos on iMovie. Fantastic. Uh, so I edited it I, and I had watched enough YouTube to kind of know like this title I think will do well, this thumbnails I think it'll do well. I learned SEO just again on YouTube, just wow. typing in SEO and like Daryl Eves came up and I watched his channel about how to do it. And I learned through YouTube. And I kept posting, and I realized if I post once a week, the videos do X amount of views. If I post twice a week, I'm all of a sudden now gaining subscribers, I'm getting more views. If I post three times a week. Mm. And so I just slowly ramped it up. So by March of 2017, I was posting three videos a week. And that's when I started noticing that all of a sudden the channel went from making like 15 cents a day, it was making upwards of like $100 a day. And for me, making $100 a day of internet money was unbelievable. Of like course. the fact that I could be anywhere in the world and make $100 yeah. a day. And real quick, how much were you making roughly just in selling homes at this point? Uh, anywhere between 150 to 250 grand a year. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people in real estate were telling me I'm wasting my time on YouTube. Of course. Because it's like, okay, sure, you're making $100 a day. But imagine if you applied that time to real estate. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the, the time I was p putting on YouTube was just, I was working basically a second full-time job. So I'd work from really 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. in real estate. And not all of that was like work, 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 but it was some downtime went on. But I'd get home and I'd work from maybe 7 to 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. doing YouTube videos. Wow. I'd do that every single day. And then weekends when I wasn't working in real estate, I'd be doing YouTube. So it was like a full-time job really, but I loved it. So it got to a point where I start, it started impacting my real estate work because in real estate, I was just thinking YouTube. Sure. That's all I wanted to do. Right. But that continued. But I did real estate still. Uh, I went to the office pretty much every day. And that's when COVID hit was mm. the moment that I thought, now is a good time to try this full time and see what what's going to happen. Yeah. And and so at that point, then you decide, I'm going all in. Yeah. Stop selling homes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Already at that point. Yeah. I what had, were you making at that point? Uh, the best year in real estate, I think I had made 500 grand. And okay. that was 20 18 or 2019. But at that time, I was scaling back on real estate because as the YouTube income was going up, I think 2019, I made a million dollars on YouTube. Okay. Um, as YouTube income went up, I just got pickier with clients. Sure. There's one client I remember. This, this is my tipping point. I think it was 2019. Uh, the client was looking for like a $5 million property or okay. something like that. He showed up late, an hour and a half late, and was on his phone for 20 minutes. And in his car, just on his phone, I'm sure. just sitting here waiting and I'm thinking, I could be, man, making, I could a be making a video. Yeah. And he gets there, looks around really quick. Probably wasn't, it was five, five minutes. Looks around, no, don't like it. I left. Like no talking afterwards. I thought, you know what? This is a sign that I really need yes. to be focusing on YouTube. I still had great clients. So like I'd service the clients that I already had, but I started referring business out. Yeah. And there's other people in my office who could handle it, give it the attention that I couldn't at the time. Yeah. Wow. I love that. So who influenced you beyond, uh, was it Rob, the, the first YouTuber you reached out to? Rob Dom. Rob Dom. Yeah. Okay. Were there other people as you were, because we kind of just fast forwarded yeah. through a lot of stuff. Were there other people on YouTube that you were watching going, I, I like this, but I would do well, this differently? And what we've been talking about is, yeah. is we talked about Ginger, 
Yep. Who, she, she, Bonds, she yeah. was instrumental. Yeah. Um, Vig, I call him because I don't yeah, want to sure. keep screwing his name up, yeah. right? And then, of course, Rob reached out and, and, and all that kind of stuff. My question is, is were there other people that you were – watching that influenced you yeah for youtube i would say for real estate we'll start there jason oppenheim was a huge one so i began working at the oppenheim group i think it was 2015 or 2016 and that was a huge one for me because all i knew was coldwell banker um a very traditional sort of brokerage i began working with jason oppenheim after seven years of working at coldwell banker opened my mind up because he was a young guy in his early 30s at the time just approached business entirely different from anything I was used to. I mean, he, and he was very aggressive and firm with his clients. I was very much used to, you do whatever your client wants, anything that they say you have to do. Jason took an opposite approach. His was, I'm going to do things my way. If the client disagrees with my strategy, I don't want them as a client. And I've never seen an agent yeah. approach it that way. Wow. But he was doing so much more business than I'd ever seen. And he was really successful. And so I'd watch him go into listing appointments and the client says, well, we want to list at $3 million. You get, I'm not going to waste my time on that. Two, six, or you know, there's another agent who's going to take it. Uh, and he would walk away from business. But what was interesting was that they would list with another agent and then come back to Jason six months later. Listing expired, I'll give it to you for two, six. And he'll say, you know what? It's not worth that. Two, five right now. They, okay, two, five. And he ends up selling it. Yeah. Um, so seeing a different approach to that really gave me the confidence that like you could be firm in your in your values and your beliefs, and if you have the confidence in it, and you know what you're doing, it, it's going to benefit everyone involved. Yeah. So seeing him on that was really eye opening. As far as YouTube, very few people were doing it on YouTube. Um, yeah. I would say back then, from what I remember, Grant Cardone, Ty Lopez, Dave Ramsey, Gary V. I think they were really the ones who were posting any sort of finance videos on YouTube right. at all. And there were a few other ones, probably. Uh, Minority Mindset, I think, was one of them. There was a few, under 10, who were doing finance. So when I got in, it was very much this uncharted territory. No one was doing it, and the people that were doing it either had something to sell or they were very traditional in the sense that, like, boring titles, thumbnails. So I approached it from, like, hey, I'm 26, 27. I'm going to approach this from how I would watch YouTube videos. And yeah. I incorporated, I think, more so like entertainment with just like, here's how to learn. Yeah. I'm curious, because I know at some point you got some help along the way, but I'm curious, did you like the YouTube idea, the, 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 the giving people advice? How much of it was the creative side where you're creating, as you just said, mm-hmm. I'm going to create a video that I would want to watch. Yeah. So I find that to be very creative mm-hmm. there. And how much of it was instructive? Is it 50-50, 70-30, or is there another element that you love yeah. about the YouTube channel? Because that's a pretty fascinating... I think, it was, I think it was just the creative aspect. I mean, my videos, to begin with, are probably 80% entertainment, 20% instructional. Right. exactly. Um, but it's to be able to make the videos that like I would want to watch myself. And you know, at the time, I didn't really have that many people in person that I could talk to about personal finance. I just had fun. I so felt it was like less a, about the finance and more about just creating something that's I valuable. Think so. The deeper picture was that I felt like I had a purpose and value that if I could make a positive difference on yes. someone's life, I, I felt like that gave me purpose. And to be able to see someone saying like, okay, I, I got my first property or I got a duplex and now I'm living for free and I got you know X, Y, Z and I could save up money. I think that like that impact is so incredible because I know how that felt to me with when I like got a response from Rob Dom. Like that yeah. was huge to me. Right. And I was like, if I could give that back to somebody and like respond to their comment, just imagine the the, the effect that that might have if you, you do that like a thousand times. Yeah. Were you really creative as a kid? And if so, in what ways? If yeah, look way back. as musical. Very so musical. Like, yeah, oh yeah. So I went from playing the piano as a kid to playing the tuba in middle school. <laughs> yeah. I laugh because I played the trumpet. Did you really? Because my yeah. parents basically made me pick an instrument. All right. But because I played trumpet every once in a while when the tuba guy couldn't play, yeah. they had to teach me how to do it. And All I right. remember the first time I played a tuba and I thought my whole head was going to go inside the mouthpiece. Mm, yeah. That's a tough instrument to yeah, play. yeah. I wow. picked I picked the loudest instrument so that I could were, pick, okay. the biggest loudest instrument, um, being like the smallest guy. Okay. I just want the biggest I one. I get it. I get uh, that. But I played the tuba from sixth grade to like tenth grade. Really? Uh, and then I also played in a school jazz band. Okay. Uh, and I learned drums on their kit. Okay. So I just so if you got to pick an instrument out. to play, which one are you picking? I love the drums the most, but I feel like the piano is the most dynamic. Okay. So I still play the piano, and I feel like if I had to pick one or the other, probably the piano. Okay. Uh, 
but I, I have the most fun with drums. Yeah. So there's the creative side of you. Yeah. To this day, I'm curious, how much, how much involvement do you have on all the videos? Like, what's your role? Pretty much everything. You're yeah. doing everything? Almost even, everything. So even to this day. A year and a half ago was the first time I hired an editor, Alex. Oh, I'm, sh I'm shocked yeah. by that. Oh, yeah, I did everything myself. I knew you did yeah. at one point, but I just wondered when you began to scale that. But to this uh, day, you're it's, very hands-on. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so every title. And so now I have Alex on my team. Right. Alex edits probably 70 to 80% of my main channel videos. Okay. And I'll take over the edit if I want to get something out fast or if okay. it's like a really special video, I'll do it myself. Okay. But Alex and I just meet for an hour and we'll brainstorm title thumbnails. Right. And I just bounce ideas back and forth until we come up with something that we're happy with. Do you, by the but, way, uh, this is fun. Do you do the thumbnail title first and then develop the content or is no. the content idea first? Yeah, it's always content idea first. Okay. So I'll sit there and usually the night before, I'll just come up with topics that I find really interesting. Okay. And I'll just make a decision. I'm planning this the next day. Okay. Um, I'll sit there for eight hours, plan out a video, okay. film it. Um, and then we'll, we'll alter the title thumbnail for that day. Cause I've noticed days where the market's down, the videos do better than days when the market's up. It's, it's crazy how much of like a day by day thing it what is. What do you think's behind that? I think when the market's down, people are more likely to watch a video to figure out why. And if the market's up, they're like, all right, the market's up. Right. I don't need to watch this. So now I want to learn how to make more. I, I find that from my experience, people are don't don't really care about making more it's it's more about not losing okay. so people are more play to apt, not lose correct gotcha. than play to win but if the market's up it's like oh it's good it's going well right. i don't need to do anything but market's yeah. down it's like why is it down a percent okay okay makes yeah. a lot of sense all right so how many hours i just heard you say if i heard you right 8 hours oh, yeah. to plan plan a video not even shoot it no what's the shooting schedule what's that it's look about like an hour and a half usually but it depends if if i'm in a mood to film and I'm like on my game and I don't like mispronounce words or stutter, then <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I could film in maybe an hour okay. and it goes really well. Bad days, two and a half hours. Okay. So how sustainable is that long term? Not. Oh gosh, no. So what are so you going to do? So I've kept up three videos for over six years. Okay. I'm starting to go down to two at this point, but that's more so like half for me because I just can't sustain it. And also no. half for like the YouTube algorithm right now is prioritizing really good longer videos. And so now two kind of feeds into the algorithm a little bit more. Okay. But it's also, I know I can't do that forever. So, no. But I went into it knowing that this is not going to be a forever thing. I'm going to do it as long as I possibly can, yeah. as long as I enjoy it. Worst case, to go down to two videos a week. That's right. Maybe one video a week. But right. there's always going to be something there. Yeah. And is, is finance, is that is that a long-term play for you? Or do you see yourself one day getting interested in something else? Because what I've learned so yeah. far from you is you get interested in something Oh, I, yeah. you, you, you you dive in. Oh, yeah. Fish tanks. Yeah. We got the cars. I mean, YouTube itself. You, you strike me as a insatiable learner once something gets your attention. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Have you allowed your brain any time for that? Not yet. I didn't think so. No, no. You can't no. even be thinking anything outside of this. Yeah. Right now, I could kind of see going into the podcast, which is where I'm, I'm focusing a lot of my time on right, right now. But it, it seems like just from my past I'll spend eight years on something and then move on to whatever's next. Okay. So far, everything has happened organically. And right. I've never consciously thought like, okay, what's next? It's always like something has organically come about. I latch onto it and like, that's the thing. And I've always had this intuition of like, this is the right choice to make. I've never been unsure about whatever I'm doing. I'm like, this is because I just feel it. With YouTube, it was some weird feeling. I was like, this is it. I just, I know it's it. And I'm going to pursue this. Yeah. With real estate, I knew within like a day, like, this is it. I'm just going to pursue it. I've not found what that is yet besides just I'm loving the podcast and I yeah. feel like the podcast is something yeah. I want to pursue. One thing I want to get your take on is is um, we have an increasingly anxious society, mm -hmm. you know, just a lot of young people, a lot of anxiousness um, that I just I don't remember encountering much of that. Uh, when I was growing up, we've got you know, social media. So we just have comparison all over the place. There's a lot of factors going into this that I don't want to distract and, and break down in this conversation. But to yeah. that end, you strike me as a guy as we listen to your story that doesn't sound like you had a whole lot of doubt, or if you did, you overcame it pretty quickly. What's the what's the real real here? Uh, with you? I don't think I ever had any doubt. But I, don't, I was, I I was sense really that. big into self-help books. So at 16, I started getting into Tony Robbins. Okay. And I read Think and Grow Rich, yep. How to Win Friends and Influence People, Two of the Awaken books. the Giant Within. A any self-help book I could yep. 
you know, find, I would read it, and I just got really into it. I felt like that was my like my cheat sheet of like if I could learn this. Right. So you developed a right. mindset that really set oh, yeah. you up big time. Yeah. How would you describe that mindset? I know you read all those books, but you developed your own mindset based on who you are, your experiences growing up. Yeah, I'm just curious what what how would you describe your mindset? And then what informed that outside of those books? Yeah. Well, the best one that summarized it was a book called The Winner Effect, yeah. which is where you get one win. It gives you the confidence to believe that you could do it again. Yep. And then when you do it again, it gives you the confidence that you could do it again. And then pretty soon, all of a sudden, everything you do is a win because you believe and you go towards those activities that are more likely to generate it. Uh, it's, it's why if you get in a downward spiral where everything you do is going to fail, it's hard to have the confidence to think, oh, I could do it because every, I, I have all these, these, these experiences in the past that have just failed me. So I think the winner effect is something that once you, once you start getting the small wins, you start looking for opportunities that feed into that even more. Yeah. So that was something that really stood out for me yeah. is that. What about your experience and environment growing up? Curious, your home life, yeah. uh, teachers, music teachers, whoever. What would you say shaped you the most as you think back to the experiences you had growing mm -hmm. up and then also the environment? Yeah, that you I think both my parents were really, really, really supportive mm -hmm. uh, emotionally. And so anything I wanted to do, there was never something where they said, oh, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. They were just really encouraging of anything that I wanted to pursue. That's great. Uh, same thing when I didn't want to do something. Yeah, I was going to ask so, about college when you decided. Oh, they were devastated. They were. Oh, yeah. I I'm mean, sure. college was something that was really because they were both the first to go to college in their families. Yeah. And so they expected me to go to college, too. So when I didn't want to. I think they were they were disappointed, but they also knew that like okay, he's he's you know eighteen, he's gonna make his own choice, and we're gonna hope that he goes back. But overall, I would say if there's something I really didn't want to do, they wouldn't force me to do it. Hmm. There were some things like you know I was taking piano lessons as a kid, like five years old or something. I was a good piano player, but I I didn't like piano lessons. I, I, I didn't like being told what to do or forced to learn scales. I just wanted to play music. I didn't want to have to learn scales, and so they stopped piano lessons mm. uh, because I just disliked it that much. Same, they put me in a karate class. Instantly, just didn't like it. Hmm. Took me out of that. Uh, Is there a so, pattern there? Because you just kind of let us in on that. Yeah. That you don't like to be instructed as much as you like to learn on your own. I think so. Yeah, looking back, I think that's pretty cool to know. Yeah, the piano lessons is something as an adult. I wish I had continued that because right. now I look and I think, oh, I w learning how to sight read music on the piano would be something I would love to do, and I could always do that in the future. But you like, can, yeah. But yeah, are we ever going to get a piano playing video on your wildly popular YouTube channel? Probably not on the YouTube channel. I, I posted a few I on my. I have, like vlog, I have a vlog channel. Oh, where you I do post some stuff. On. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. I got to tell you, I'd love to see that. Okay. I'd love to see your growth. Yeah. Like, okay, I gave it up. Now I'm going to go back to it again because I find that to be very, very fascinating. Okay. In fact, if I could play the piano now, I would put a big, giant grand piano in my house and invite all my friends over and we would just sing. We mm. would have singing parties. As lame as that sounds. No, that's I, I, Yeah. And I think that's really fun uh, to find people like you that are very accomplished and you kind of have this talent over here that kind of has laid dormant. Uh it's probably not going to happen, but that's my content sure. suggestion. I think people okay. would love it. Deal. <laughs> Do you sing or just play? Just play. I'm definitely not a singer. Really? Uh, Can't gosh, hold no. a note at oh, all? Oh, gosh, no. Uh, no that's no, no, even no, more playing. fascinating. All right. So what I want to go back to the story, the, the way your parents and that environment there. And so you tell them, all right, uh, I'm not going to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you had mentioned that you weren't a good student. Right. And yet they were still very, very understanding. I got. What would you say to parents out there that are all stemmed up and all worked up because their kid isn't that, I'm going to call it, an, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, it's actually complimentary, like my brother, my younger brother. He's the assembly line kid in that you're running through school, he's going to get A's and everything. And mm -hmm. I struggled mightily, yeah. except for about two subjects. Uh, what would you say to parents who, who have a kid like you or like me? It's tough because I feel like I'm not a parent, so I, know I don't you're not, know but you've exactly been what. Parented. I I worry I'm an anomaly because it's like I would skip school, but I never got in trouble. Like I was skipping school to work, and I was very much like work oriented. So your parents save money. knew you were skipping school after the fact. After yeah, the fact. yeah, they did. They had no idea because like, the school and, system's going. Where's Where's Graham? But I would call in pretending to be my parents. Okay, I knew you did that once or twice. You did this a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my senior year of high school, I made a, a, a pact with me and some friends that I would miss at least one day a week of school every week for, for 
my high school. Yeah, this is this but is I would heroic call, stuff, but, I think. But I was never ditching and hanging out. It was always, I'm going to skip school. I'm going to show up to work early. Seven o'clock in the morning, oh, I was yeah. going to be showing I up. I love that. Working a full day of work. Like, I loved that. And I, I, it was hard for me to sit in class knowing that if I, if I work and I take pictures of fish and coral, I can make $100 that day. Or I could be in class and earn nothing. Like, I'd rather $100 than be in class. I knew that nothing I was learning in school, I was going to use. It was hard for me yeah. to wrap my mind around, like, why am I here? I, I get that. And I love that. And, and to that end... I, I don't know what your opinion is on this. Do you think YouTube in some ways is pouring gas on the fire that is burning with our traditional education system where, where we're starting to realize there are some kids that are just great entrepreneurs, whether it's something silly yeah. or something informational, um, and they can make a lot of money by just well, making videos. Yeah. Do you think it's ushering well, this in quicker? Yes and no. I what think do you mean the, by no? It's, it's the internet in general. I think YouTube is, is a part of it. Well, that's good. Yeah, but right. even like we were speaking um, – a few weeks ago to this guy, Anker, who started a, a really successful company called Teachable. And he was saying, well, he was in high school. He was making something like 50, up to 50 grand a day making Facebook apps in high school. Good gracious. And so he was one of these kids that saw Facebook taking off. Apps were taking off on that. And he'd get in on this, make an app. Uh, he was doing a lot of those surveys, like which Harry Potter character are you? Oh, those things were And like, people would go oh. through and click through, but every time you click next, yeah. it would be an ad. Yeah. And so he said those could ramp up up to like $50,000 a day. They'd run for a few months, make another app, and he'd be doing that. Uh, I think just the internet's given yes. people so many opportunities. It's really leveled the playing field in yep. such a way that we haven't seen before, and you could scale your income so quickly no matter where you are in the world. Yeah. Uh, but it's also now extremely competitive. Right. So I think a lot of people see the outliers on that. Um, it's it's a lot, you have to really enjoy it. Yeah. Like he was the type he was predisposition really enjoy that type of work That's and right. being on the computer. And we should also fun. point out very talented at it too. Correct. I think you really have to play to your strengths and what yeah. you're interested in. I yeah. think everything that I was doing, I would have done it for free. Yeah. So I've always gone into it like if I wouldn't be doing this for free, is it really something I want to work at? Um, yeah. Probably not. Yeah. But you know, like real estate, I would like yeah. in the beginning. I just want to work for him for free. Like my my pitch in the beginning was like, I'll just do whatever you want to, and I did. Yeah. If he wants me to put up open house signs that Sunday yeah. morning for free, like I, I never asked for anything in return. Yeah. Uh, all right, just a fun little fun little test here. You pick any word you want, just one word. Uh, but what's one word that comes to mind when I ask you what do you do best? And this is from a work context. What do you do best? I'd say entertain. Entertain. I feel like entertain is one of the best ways to teach yep. and one of the best ways Absolutely. to learn. It's how you retain information. So like I, if you if you showed me a video that was very analytical or boring, it's hard for me to pay attention to it. But if it's funny and you have some like, you, you know, aspect to it that you could relate to yep. with, with, you know, a little humor mixed in and I, that's how I retain information. Okay. All right. Second question is what do you love to do most in that work context? What do you love to do most? I think oh, I should probably share. Share. Yeah. Okay. Share. And that would be sharing my opinion on. I love talking about my opinion on certain topics. Yeah. Well, so if I could pick a topic, favorite topic. Yeah. And just, <laughs> hey, here's my opinion about this. Right. Uh, agree or disagree. Right. But I try, like, my, my strength, I, I think, is trying to pick both sides. And then find commonalities between them and share like the middle of the road. So like I will present like here's a for and against it and kind of here's where I thought, you know, here's where I th what I think about it and the pros and cons of each yeah. side. I love that. All right. And the final one is, and again, one word, work context. Yeah. What results motivate you? What, what, what motivates you from your work? Progress. Hmm. Explain that. So I like to see something improving, you know, yeah. that if there's, if there's progress, it's either – they're getting better. The videos are getting better. The numbers are going up. Subscribers uh, could be money, but but I, I don't want to I don't want to be stagnant. I don't want to be doing the same thing and not getting any results. Yeah. I'd like to see that there there is an improvement in some category. Yeah. How would you describe your core uh, watcher or user of your resources? Uh, what's that demographic look like? Oh, gosh. Age, yeah. finances. Well, generally, it's eighteen to thirty five. If I were to like summarize it, I think it's more so probably. 20 to 30 okay. seems to be the core demographic, 85% male. Okay. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people who are frugal in nature. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So that, that allows you to keep a really good grasp of the problems you're thinking about all the time. When you're coming up with new content, you're thinking of that group. 
Well, I just, I think that I represent a lot of the people who I make videos for. Yep. And so if I find a topic interesting or if I'm, yes. you know, interested in something, other people will yeah. too. And so you that's just really nailed, what, how I approach it. Yeah. And, and I think what you've done is, is you said that very succinctly and I think it's really powerful and I want people to make sure they heard what you said. Um, and, and that's the secret to all great creators. You're creating content that matters to you. And there's a lot of people in this world that are wired like you. Yeah. This is a big world. Yeah. And sometimes I think content providers and people that want to do good, they get all worked up trying to figure out what the message is instead of just saying, what is my voice? And I'm going to share my voice. And some people will come to it. Other people will not. Yeah. And isn't that really what it boils down to? you got to create something yeah. that you care about. I agree. I think it's a balance, too, because on YouTube especially, you have to do what the audience wants as well. And so if there's a topic that you think, I'm not necessarily as into it, but I know that's what most people would want to see. I have to play to that too. I mean, at the end of the day, the videos I make are really for the audience. And so if I'm reading my comments and I see 100 comments, they all want one topic, 100% right. I will do that topic. Oh, I agree. Yeah. But you got two different things you were describing yeah. there. That initial thing is building the audience. Correct. But once you have the audience, you got to serve the audience. Oh, 100%. So that is that juxtaposition sure. there. You're not everything you're doing is something you get excited about, but it doesn't matter anymore. Correct. Because you got an audience who's saying, hey, Graham, I, I need this from you. Right. And they literally get to that place where they feel like, I need this from you. Yeah. And that's a pretty that's a pretty rewarding position, isn't it? Is. It? it is. It's cool to see because sometimes I get self-conscious if, if everyone else is talking about something. And I feel like, what more can I add right. on that topic? It is cool to see that people still want to hear what I have to say about it. If yeah. if, even if it's just the same thing as everybody else, it, it, it's cool to know that they'd still want my take on it. Yeah. What do you think the, the view of finances in general uh, are from your audience? Are they worried about the economic future? Are they, are they somewhat confident? Are they uh, ambivalent? I mean, what, what, what do you sense from your audience, their view on the greater economy and where we are in this really unique time in history? I think there's always opportunity. And I'd like oh, to sure. think that the, that the audience in general is more opportunistic about you know, the long term. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I think. Um, even now, I'm sure there's an opportunity out there. You look hard enough. It's, it's there. Um, and it's really just about finding it. Yeah. Or even if you don't want to find it. I think long term, I think it's always safe to bet on the market. Yeah. Uh, if you had uh, uh, a bunch of 20-somethings, the whole world of 20-somethings, right? And they're gathered around and they're watching you on YouTube. Yeah. But the challenge before you is to just give them one thought that would encourage them towards an entrepreneurial venture. All right? So I know I've created a fantastical scenario here, but I'm curious if you could only share one message with them. They're starting out, or maybe they haven't even started yet. They're just in that dreaming and scheming stage. Yeah. What would be that message you'd share with them? Probably to start. I feel like a lot of people just get in their head about overlearning. Yeah. And I've been, I've been in that spot before oh, yeah. where you feel like, oh, I shouldn't start because I don't know enough. But honestly, when you just start, you figure it out as you go. And I yeah. think I think learning to be self-sufficient is mm -hmm. really, really, really important. That if you get to a, a, a block, learning how to find that answer and overcome that. And half the time, it's Google. Mm -hmm. probably actually 90% of the time is just Googling your problem. Right. Learn it, get to the next one, get another right. problem, Google it, or YouTube. Yeah. Guaranteed. There's there's something for, like I was even trying to figure out how to, uh, what was it, jumpstart a car or something like that. And I, I looked it up on YouTube for the exact make and model <laughs> and like there it was. Right. So easy. It's oh, like yeah. someone, someone's already done it on YouTube. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. All right, so w as we've been talking, I mean, you've had, you know, a lot of just blessing, man. Things have gone your way. You've worked hard, though, for those things to go your way. Mm -hmm. I asked you about doubt earlier. You didn't have to deal with that. You created some great mindsets by kind of reading the giants mm -hmm. uh, and, and not allowing yourself to kind of stay stuck in this, you know, merry-go-round of negative thoughts. I'm just curious, what are your challenges? In, in your business, what are some challenges that you've had to, to, to overcome and, and they kind of keep popping up? Anything? Yeah, I would definitely say right now the the YouTube finance space I think is overly saturated. I think it, it's a competitive industry today. Yeah. I can't see a future where it exists in the same capacity that it does. And I'm trying to think, how can I make this sustainable for just in, in general? Meaning what? So I understand yeah. the words you're using, but yeah. when you say, I don't know if I see a future where it exists in its current capacity, what yeah. does that mean? To remain innovative, you have to figure out what's the next thing. Right. And I've not found that. 
Um, and so for me, I'm struggling thinking, you know, in the beginning, I was very much, I felt like at the forefront of just ideas, Without creation. Yeah. Now I feel like I'm behind and I feel like other people are doing it better. Um, I'm at a point I know where I feel like sometimes I, I feel more burnt out than I have been at any other point, less excited than I, than I did six years ago doing YouTube videos. What's driving that? I think I felt like I've accomplished everything that I, that I set out to do and there's less challenge than uh, than I used to get. And you know, so, that's, you're in a very interesting yeah. situation because the challenge isn't there, and I think that's what drives you. Yeah. But now, on top of that, you're doing a lot. So, right. so, so you get to a place where I'm losing the challenge. Right. It's not as exciting as it was. Let's just be honest. It's yeah. okay to say that. Yeah. You're not as challenged, and on top of that, you're tired. Yes. I got to tell so, you, I mean, that's not yeah. doom and gloom, but I mean, uh, yeah, it, it feels like, no, I feel like there's something new and exciting that you'll have to come up with soon. Correct. I don't think you'll stay where you are. Correct. So that's what a lot of people have been telling me, but um, trying to figure out what that next thing is. I know the podcast is something I love and I could see, I, I've- Where do you think that's going? What, what are you trying to do differently there? We're traveling. So just the fact that I'm here, yeah. uh, I- it would have been extremely difficult a year ago today to sure. do this because every single day, eight to 12 hours, I was in my office making videos. And so I didn't give myself any time. That's crazy. At all. I take half days on the weekends, but that's it. But traveling, you got to think that's a full day of travel. Oh, yeah. I get back, I'm thrown off, uh, you yep. know, plus the time doing everything else. Like I, I wouldn't even be here. So yeah. now I'm taking time to travel. And I think learning from other people is something that I've I've not done enough of oh, throughout yeah. these last few years. So yeah. now that's given me the opportunity to do yeah. this. But I don't know. I, I know there's something else. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. And that and that's really frustrating to me because I always so far I've I've always had the next thing lined up because yeah. it just happened organically. The podcast, like I said, I could easily do that another ten to fifteen years. Oh, I want to dedicate more sure. time to that. But in the big picture, what is it? I don't know. Yeah. I so I, I got a feeling it's gonna come up in some of these conversations you're having. Maybe. You know, you're a learner. Yeah. You're insatiable. Yeah. And you start learning and seeing things. That's really fascinating yeah. to me. It's, it's tough for me because I I, th I want to do a business of some sort. And I think of all these businesses that I could do. And I saw like, uh, we, we did a podcast over at the Daily Wire. Yeah. And I saw their operation. I thought, oh my, this, like, this would be perfect to get on other finance creators and bring them up to and build a whole media company around finance. And I think, is that really what I enjoy doing? Probably not. And then I think, ooh, I could build a business around doing shorts content because I think that's the direction that we're going online is 60 second clips. No one's really doing that. But imagine I build a business around other creators and just do their shorts yeah. and build a team around that. We could get really good. At, do I really enjoy that? Probably not. So it's got to be something that I could just like, I would do for free. Yeah. Uh, well, I tell I you where know. it's going to be. It's going to yeah. be at the intersection of those three things we Probab talked about. Probably. What you do best. Yeah. What you love to do and what motivates you. Yeah. And what you're what's interesting about you is 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 the the element of creation combined with instruction. Yeah. You really love sharing your take on things. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you'll always want to do that? I don't know. I you found get a little like, juice doing that though, I, don't you? Sometimes, but now I've I found myself just being a little bit more private. Like I I have been I don't know, more like reserved. I feel like because I've just I've been tired of sharing everything, and and now now it's time where it's like I like having stuff to myself. I like kind of being out of it a little, and it was like the opposite of like, hey, I'm making you more YouTube videos now, but like the private life sort of stuff. Like I like having that. Uh, yeah, it, it's just I guess I you always kind of like what you what you don't have as much of. So yeah. maybe it's like I maybe I some wonder. Of that, yeah. I just wonder. Yeah. If it's a rhythm thing for you, maybe I, I, I'm I'm married with three kids, so I have a very different life than you have. Yeah. Okay. But the idea of putting eight to ten hours every day into the creative process to me, who I do a live show every day and yeah. have been doing it for years, so I come from a whole different world. Like you don't even know what radio is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's old school, and 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 and. But I mean, I I have a rhythm where I'm turning it off every day. Mm -hmm. Literally turning it off, going home, wife, kids, golden doodle. I'll walk with my wife tonight. I'll help one of my kids with probably some type of studying or something like that. Then there's other hobbies, working out, golf, the whole nine yards. There's a rhythm where my my brain and heart get a chance to rest. And I just wonder if you don't have that rhythm because it, to the point where you've been doing it so well and yeah. set such a high level, that's a lot of pressure to be putting eight to ten hours in every day. Sure. 
I, what are your thoughts on that? I just curious. How well, does that? I, th- I thought that now was time to do it. Like I know that I can't do this at like fifty. Right. So throughout my twenties, it was an easy one where it was right. just like I had the energy to do it and yeah. I'm going to do it. Um, but that continued to the point where you know I hit thirty and I was like, wow, it's really going well. Yeah. Why, why stop? And I enjoy it. Right. So I'm going to keep going. But now it's that you know it's sort of that teeter totter where it's starting to lean the other way, um, and that's why so I'm, I'm wondering. Sure it's, it's, what do you think about scaling yourself a little bit so that the rhythm changes and the enjoyment stays where it is? I'm just curious what you think about that. Do you process that? You got I mean, one guy. Sometimes, yeah, you're crushing but, it. But you know, when I really think of what it was, what I'm happiest doing sometimes is just being in my office. Listening to music, right. planning video by myself. Right. And so sometimes like that's where I'm the happiest. So right. when I really go back to that, it's like I don't want to outsource that because that's like well, my, I get that. my opinion. So that's what like, would you my outsource? Words. If you had to, what would you outsource? I don't know if I would, honestly. Because I whatever I could have outsourced, I probably already would have. Yeah. Uh, if I could do it at such a high enough level, probably title and thumbnail. Yeah, uh, would be the the easiest yeah. ones to outsource. And but you understand time, why like, I'm asking you that? Yeah, because at some point, like you don't want to outsource, mm-hmm. but the rhythm and the process that you're in just is beating yeah. you down. Well, maybe I just stop. I mean, that's the thing. I it could always it. just be at a point where I could just stop. You just if say I really I'm want done, yeah. and then I try something new. Yeah, no, or I just scale, slowly scale back. All but. right. Well, we're not making any announcements. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't want anybody to read into yeah. this, but I just love the transparency here because this is something that I want people to understand. I mean, you've put in the work for a long amount of time, yeah. and then well, you got to decide: do I scale or do I just? Well, start I went over? into YouTube looking at the average lifespan of a YouTube person is five to seven years if they do it well. So, meaning I kinda, that it just the audience just oh, eventually yeah. moves yeah. on. Every every channel that I've ever watched, five years is a success. Like they did a great job at five years. Seven years is about the lifespan of someone who's doing it like the the top percent. Very few ever make it past 10. What kind of a drop is it usually? Is there a way to even describe that? Probably, usually I would say a drop of like 80%. 80%? Yeah. Most most channels will stop uploading. So the most I've seen, most channels will, will post well for like three years, four years, then just trail off. Right. Either the algorithm changes, they lose their audience, they stop posting, they, they're not consistent. I would say half of it is problem or laziness or other issues with the creator a lot of times i've seen people get very complacent they make money and they think oh i could just this yeah. will continue forever i don't have to work out anymore and they stop right and then the other half is an algorithm change uh where all of a sudden what they were doing doesn't work anymore and you have to readapt and you have to relearn everything and i think when you've been doing it for long enough it's like do you have the energy do you want to yeah. do that again yeah like well, where do you know. see mr beast going i read about this guy's schedule but yeah. he's also diversified too Oh, yeah. He has his hands in everything. And that's a smart play, I guess, Correct. if we're listening here yeah. on this whole YouTube strategy. If you can get it to a certain oh, point gosh. where you can he's, diversify. He's the outlier because he's yeah. not only obsessed with YouTube, but he also hires people who are right. just as obsessed. I've met a lot of people on his team, and they're all mini Mr. Beasts. <laughs> like, when you speak to anybody on on his team, they're just as obsessed. Yeah. Like, he hires the outliers of the outlier. Like, they're the top point zero 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 one percent of yeah. that. Like. Even, even talking to people on his team, they are so particular, like, oh, if we put this in, retention's going to drop by this, we have to put this over here. Like, they're, they're just as obsessed. Right. So he's built out such a fantastic operation and diversified. Mm. Wow. Um, we've, we talked about this throughout the, the, your story, but how much do you put a premium on making sure that you're asking for help? You know, the, I think the most underutilized question in the world is, will you help me? I think there's a lot of pride built up in that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to look like I'm a leech. But this idea of asking for help, when you certainly when you're young and you're getting started, what premium do you put on that? The, the value of other people in our lives to help us get where we want to go. Are you asking from the helper or the helpee? Like if I'm if I'm asking the for help, the helpee. I, I, I want to get your opinion on that. So if I'm asking for help, yeah, I think it's fine. But I think sometimes you have to think like, what can you provide as well? Uh, because if I just went up and be like, hey, I need help. What can you do for me? Very few people are going to say like, oh yeah, I'm going to help you. Uh, I always went from offering value first. Like, I'm willing to do anything you want for free. Right. I will do anything. Yep. Uh, all I want to do is just be able to learn from you. Yeah. And I won't take up much of your time. But so I've always gone in with like, what can I offer? That's right. And there's always something. Yeah. But I feel like just 
because I have people all the time. Hey, will you mentor me? And will you do oh, this? Oh no, no, or like, no, hey, I'll, yeah. yeah. But there's always something that you could offer in return to help that right. person. And it's always going to be different depending on the That's person. That's right. But, but at the at the early stage in the story you told us, when you're going into these open houses, you didn't really have much to offer other than hunger, and that is attractive to some people. In other I agree. words, if can I just pick your brain in yeah. the open house? That's value. Oh yeah, because they feel valuable. Mm-hmm. So that's my whole point is I just think that, you know, I love the hustle factor. I love getting after it. I I just couldn't be more rugged individual. That's my whole thing. But, you know, we've got to see the value in how other people can help us get where we want to go. And it's not a just do this for me, Mm -hmm. but it is understanding that very few successful men and women get to where they are on their own. That's true. And I want people to get that because I feel like in the in the Internet world, And I could be wrong. I don't mind you telling me if I'm wrong, but I feel like because the internet has flattened the world, it has Mm -hmm. brought opportunity to everybody, this idea of just always doing it on your own, I think it's limiting. Oh, yeah. I mean, as far as help, YouTube is fantastic, and Reddit is another one. I I joined a community called NewTubers on Reddit, and that was also instrumental. I'd post updates every month on my channel. It's just like, here's, and I would write these long posts about what worked for me and people would comment back and it's interesting. So, but yeah, just in general, people are helpful. Yeah. I feel like too, if you, if you approach an individual, a lot of that's about timing too. It's like finding someone who's, who has the time, who's open to it. Not everyone's going to be receptive. That's right. Well, and that's the thing I admire most about you, young Graham. I really Mm. admire that you just kept going to the open houses and you kept showing up in the right place and then the right time happened. Yep. You know, it was not luck. Yep. There was no happenstance about what happened with you. So I, I really love that. I want to ask you, what are you most proud of? Probably the impact. It's just any positive impact that I can have on somebody else. What what gets me the most is when people say they're house hacking. So like I love when someone said, I bought a duplex in 2018 because I saw your video about how you live for free. And I bought a duplex and I have a tenant who's now paying my mortgage and I built a whole bunch of equity in doing that and now I'm investing. Like that sort of stuff really gets me because like that one change in the beginning could set like the entire trajectory of the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's stuff like you don't forget. Like if you do that at 20 years old, pay it off. Uh, then once it's paid off, I mean that that's cash flow forever and you always have a place to fall back on. So like that stuff like that really does it for me. Yeah, I love it. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, I, I love your story. I, I think you really, uh, in some ways, are a poster child for the new entrepreneur in, in, in this world that we've lived in and, and watched YouTube just kind of expand the ability to influence people right in their home. And uh, I, I think you're the, the new wave of broadcaster. You know, traditional you. broadcasting did its thing and, and still sort of exists. But to, to be able to help people and meet people, and I love your story. I know a lot of people are going to be inspired by uh, you sharing your story. So I'm grateful you hung out with us, man. Yeah, and I'm really excited, by the way, really about what's next. Cool. It Just watching your brain work while we're sitting here talking, you know, there's you're a guy that needs that next new frontier. Yeah. I think you are the entrepreneur's entrepreneur. Thank you. And, yeah, I'm uh, curious to see what it is. Yeah, I'm excited too. Yeah. Whatever you do, you're going to do it well. Thank you. Yeah, man. I appreciate you yeah. hanging. Thanks so All much. Right, bro. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was Thank fun. you. If you enjoyed that conversation, help us spread the word and the good talk by liking and subscribing and sharing.